we are actually all the time below the compute rules. So we can, it kind of suggests that we are compute bound and there is mixed where we have bandwidth slopes and the compute roof on top. So by detecting the region where your application is placed, this gives you a first hint on what is the optimization strategy that we should take. So if you're placed in the green region, which is the memory bound region, probably we should invest mostly in improving our access pattern or use the caches, which means to overcome memory aspects of which are, are drawbacks in our application. If you are in the blue part, probably it's better to focus more on vectorization or parallelization of your code in order to reach the compute truth. If you're in the grain part, this is a little bit more difficult to optimize because here you might be mixed by both. So in that case, probably we would like to uh, apply both memory and compute parts. And we will see in the use case, one of these applications, how we can actually optimize. Them. So what's the trick when we analyze the application here and how we can detect the first bottlenecks? So since in the cache of roofline model, arithmetic intensity is the property of your application. It is not expected that your application, that your arithmetic intensity will change unless you restructure your code. So as you optimize your application, you will improve your performance. So the first thing we do is to draw imaginary vertical line at the arithmetic intensity of your application. And then we will look which of the roof lines we are intersecting in order to detect the potential bottlenecks. So the idea is to first optimize your application in order to overcome the first line that is positioned above. Of course, the lines below also might matter. So the idea here is that if we don't restructure our code and we make it faster, our performance will get better. And as performance is getting better, my application is going to go up and up and up with every optimization that we apply. And the idea is to hit the topmost rule that we have, which means better performance that that we cannot achieve. Of course, you, we cannot break any roof higher than L1, given uh, our application characteristics. So, okay, once we know how to analyze it, let's look to the first simple case study. In fact, this is typical matrix multiplication, but this is not a regular one. We actually put a little bit of effort in order to derive very well optimized AVX version of the code. Uh, the details of the code are here, but let's imagine for simplicity that this is very, very, very simple matrix multiplication. And we start with the basic implementation that has all three matrices in a row major order. So due to really bad accesses to the B matrix, as we can see in the point one, our first performance point will be DRAM bound, as suggested by the cache of line model. And then we draw this vertical line, as we can see, that there is a potential that we reach the compute roof, but we first need to overcome all those memory problems that we have. So in order to overcome them, we first did very typical strategies in optimization of matrix multiplication, which is to transpose matrix B, and then we improve our accesses, which means we will have a better L2 utilization. And then as we can see in the roof line, our point two is positioned between L3 and zero. In order to further improve our performance, since we're still memory bound, we will actually, we actually apply cache blocking for each of the cache levels. And then each one of those optimizations in points three, four, and five gave us improvements in terms of the performance. Of course, they are not so visible here because don't forget performance is in the log scale. And then we really didn't know what to do more. So we just ran Intel MKL, which has a lot of like magic inside in order to extract the full performance of Intel uh, architectures. And as initially predicted by point one, we can see that with Intel MKL implementation of matrix multiplication, we were in fact able to hit the roof that, that was predicted initially. So, okay, from the, but we didn't stop there. So what we actually realized is that uh, nowadays applications are not, so, are not so straightforward as the matrix multiplication. They might have different instruction mixes. They might even mix um, uh, different vector instructions such as AVX and SCC. They might have, they, they, then we have the scalars. They might have different load store ratios or even different FP shares in, in their code. This actually hinted that presenting absolute maximums for the roof line might not be adequate for each and every type of applications, especially if my application is not capable of exploiting those architecture maximums. So what we try to do 
is to derive application-driven CARM or cache pair offline model, which will allow scaling the roofs in order to meet the, the real application demands. In order to better show this, we picked up on the ISO 3DFD, which is quite optimized 3D stencil in its color implementation. And then we plotted in the absolute CARM, which is the one that shows the absolute maximums of the architecture, and also in our very recent research in application-driven CARM to see how it is going to be characterized. When we look in the absolute car, I and mean, as we already know, when we draw this vertical line, we can actually see that it is positioned in the mixed region, suggesting that we can probably optimize this application by improving some memory accesses up until reaching compute roof. But this was really viewed conclusion, knowing that this application is, um, is um, uh, actually stencil. And then when we look to the application-driven car, by scaling the roofs according to the application demands, what we could actually see is that our point is deep in the memory bound region, positioned on top of the L2 line, which suggests that for this application, probably there is very little something that we can do in order to further boost the performance because this is a stencil. And as you know, it might exploit locality in L1 for majority of accesses, but there is always this weird one or two accesses that will go to the DRAM. In order to better suggest this, we work very hard with the Intel advisor team to also give second set of optimization hints, for example, in terms of the memory traffic. And we can see that 1% of DRAM traffic actually contributes to 7% of performance degradation because our point is not in L1. So in terms of the arithmetic intensity, typically, just to answer to the question, uh, we typically were relying by the counters for validation in our initial research. Nowadays, in uh, in more, more modern tools, uh, it's actually done by analyzing your assembly code and applying the multipliers for each. So when we look to this characterization, it was completely different over that one, and it actually quite well matched what we expected for a 3D stance. So uh, when they, we also try to track how it will scale once we vectorize this code, and what we saw is that after uh, uh, vectorizing it for AVX512, application-driven CARM have this consistent characterization where our application was still memory bound. And now, since we already know when we vectorize the code, there is a tendency that our application becomes more memory bound. We can clearly see that now our DRAM accesses become dominant in our execution, hence the reduction in performance. I mean, we got higher performance, but now we are L3 bound. While in absolute current, we can see a shift still in the, in the mixed region, but slightly drifting towards memory bound. So now, since we already learned about the performance cache aware offline model, we tried actually to extend this model to model power consumption and energy efficiency upper bounds of the architectures. So let's recap the performance part. So remember, there was a bandwidth slope when we are limited by the memory, and there is a, this blue part when we are limited by the peak performance of our compute unit. And when we look, there is this intersection between the memory and compute part, which we typically call reach point. The reach point is a sweet spot in the architecture, which means that this is the minimum arithmetic intensity to achieve the maximum performance of the architecture. Or otherwise, when we look to the application, this is exactly the point where I will spend exactly the same amount of time to compute and to transfer my data. So this is the best for performance, but when you think about the power consumption, and we are talking here about the average power consumption, this is probably the worst point that we can get because we have all our units completely active in the compute part and also in the memory subsystem. And then as we compute more, which means we have arithmetic intensity going here in the compute part, it means that in the overall time that is taken to execute, the contribution of memory is going to be lower since our total time will be dominated by the time to compute. When you think about power, as your arithmetic intensity is growing, your power consumption is going to asymptotically drop toward the power that is required only to run compute units. The same behavior comes for the memory bound region, which means since my time now becomes completely dominated by memory transfers and my contribution of computes is diminishing here, my power is also going to drop towards the power that is consumed of a memory level that I'm currently accessing. 
And then you remember, what happened here is that in the cache of a roofline model, we will have several bandwidth slopes for each level of memory hierarchy. And that actually means that we will have several peaks or several hills for each level in our power cache of a roofline model. And then as we go from L1, L2 to L3, our power consumption will raise and for DRAM will actually be lower. And the reason why it's lower here is because we are modeling the power of the cores here by relying on Intel REPL. And in that case, we actually don't model complete DRAM. It's just the DRAM power as perceived by the core while serving the memory request that go to the DRAM. So when we look to this one, is that there are, there are ranges of arithmetic intensities that we can cover. And what we did here is for an Intel architecture of Ivy Bridge back then, but now we have also for the most recent one and the studies are the same, we run experimental validation across a wide range of arithmetic intensities that I can have for my application. And then, as you can imagine, different arithmetic intensities will actually provoke different hills that we can see here as a grayish bar. And then by connecting all of those maximum powers here with this black line, we can define a total power roof line. Total power roof line will in fact tell us that this is the maximum power consumption that I can have for my processor for any given arithmetic intensity of my application. We also define several different models, as you can see on the right, for core domain, for round core domain, for the package. And since we had power and performance model already derived, we could actually use it to derive many different efficiency models, such as power efficiency, energy, or EDP efficiency. And the one that was the most interesting was energy efficiency cache of a roof flight model that actually depicts the maximum of energy efficiency of my architecture for different arithmetic intensities. And as we can see, since at the reach point, we get maximum performance, but we also get the maximum power consumption, the reach points do not correspond to the maximum energy efficiency. In fact, maximum energy efficiency of the architecture can only be obtained for the region of infinite arithmetic intensity. We also have some math to derive, but that is in the paper. So, okay, if you look to the matrix multiplication example that we just saw for the performance, we also plotted for the energy efficiency cache of fine model in power one. Energy efficiency was not really surprising that it was actually following the performance one since here, the difference in the values between the performance in GFLOPs and the WAPs was really dominating. So with each performance improvement we get, we also got better energy efficiency. What was more interesting here is actually power consumption curve and how this study actually behaved here. So as we were accessing DRAM, we got a power consumption that was expected for DRAM accesses. And then as we access more L3, our power consumption was raising. As we block for L3, our power consumption was the highest. But then as we start using more L2 or L1 or even MKL here, we can actually see that our power consumption is dropping since we're spending more time in the L1 than in the other cache levels. This actually suggests that by combining all of these models, we can completely derive different hints on every other aspect, which is not only performance. We also played with DVFS analysis, like analyzing the maximums of our architecture when we scale the frequency of Intel processors. We also applied for the GPU, uh, GPUs for NVIDIA, and very recently uh, it is um, implemented also for Intel GPUs. And we also derived several different methodologies to analyze it for former KNL and for multi socket systems. So now let's move to the one another case study, which is epistasy detection. Epistasy detection is one important application in bioinformatics. And before I deep dive into epistasy detection, let us give just an overview of what epistasy actually means. So epistasy is in a nutshell, if you remember from the uh, high school biology classes, is that in each human cell, we actually have pairs of chromosomes. And each of those chromosomes is inherited by mother or by father. And then each chromosome is constituted by a really long stripe of DNA. And there are certain portions of this DNA that are defined in the gene. And this is represented here, for example, with those squares. And then for a single gene, we have a different combination of the nucleotides here. 
And then these different combinations actually are making us who we are. And this makes a difference among all of us. But the genes are positioned at the same place, and this is called locus. So what those clever folks from bioinformatics discovered is that certain genes, they have everything the same, which is called allele, but some alleles in their encoding, they're just differing in a single nucleotide, like you can see here. They have everything the same, except that one has TA and the other has CG. And what they discovered that this subtile difference in a single nucleotide, which is called single nucleotide polymorphism, can have such a big differences between humans in a sense that just small difference can cause life-threatening disease, such as Alzheimer's, breast cancer, and so on and so on. This is a research that is still ongoing even in the bioinformatics, and detecting epistasis actually means that different genes at different places can interact one with another. But as for now, for many diseases, we don't know which genes interact with, with another, neither how many. And that's why this is a very challenging task, but super important for humans. So let's just iterate over that. So as we just said, so we have those two chromosomes, one from mother and one from mother, and in a single gene, we have those two alleles, A1 and A2 in this example. And as you remember, some alleles can be dominant and recessive. Dominant here are blue boxes, recessive are green boxes. And dominant doesn't mean anything else than this is just more prevalent uh, combination in a human population, so there are more people with that trait or that characteristic. Recessive one is less prevalent in human population. So for it, this means that for any human or for any combination of genes or SNPs, as we call it here, is that we can define our genotype. And I'm not going to bother you anymore with bioinformatics because from now we are just going to talk numbers. So it means that we can just simply say that my genotype can be zero if my alleles are both dominant. It can be one if one is dominant and the other is recessive, or it can be two if both of them are recessive. This basically means that by three binary, very simple vectors, zero, one, and two representing a genotype, we can say that, for example, for a single SNP X, our patient zero has genotype one. And then in our data sets, we will be focusing on a single trait or imagine single disease, imagine breast cancer. And then in our data set, we will have additional vector that is going to tell us if that patient has a disease or not. For example, in this case, our patient zero with genotype one has a phenotype of zero, which means he doesn't have the disease and we're gonna call this guy control. But in our data set, we can also have a patient one, for example, that has genotype two, and this guy has a disease. But we're not gonna have only two patients. What we're gonna have in our data set, we will have many, many patients. And for example, N patients here, and for all of them, we will have this information if they have disease or not in a phenotype vector, and what is their genotype. And of course, in a data set, we're not going to have only one SNP. We're going to have many SNPs, so think about your uh, genetic material. And each of those SNPs in our data set is going to be separated in blue, gray, and uh, green vectors, which represent genotypes. So zero, one, and two. So just to give you uh, an idea, the data set that we test in this study has more than 100,000 samples, patients, and has more than 10,000 SNPs, each of them with three vectors. So what makes epistasis challenging is, if we talk just about two-way epistasis, which means pair-way interaction, it means that we have to go and then inspect each and every combination of SNPs and see which one correlates more with my phenotype vector in order to say, oh, this genetic material actually is the one that's gonna contribute to certain disease. This means that we have to investigate each and every combination of the genotypes that I have, for example, or each and every SNPs that I have, for example, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and so on and so on until we exhaust every pairs of our SNPs in a data set. This gives quite large number of combinations to uh, investigate in the data set that we use here for testing. This results in more than 50 million combinations to actually go and match. 
So what does it mean to find the pistasis? So when we pick up two SNPs, in that case, first thing we need to do is to construct the frequency table. And the frequency table is pretty much simple thing, which means we go pick up two genotype vectors, and then we create frequency table for each genotype combination. So for example, here I pick X1 vector of uh, first SNP that I'm analyzing and Y0 vector of the second SNP that I'm analyzing, which gives me a genotype combination of one zero. And then frequency table is nothing more than just counting the number of occurrences of your cases and controls in the data set for SNPs that we are calculating here for each of those genotype combinations. And then since you remember, we binarized our data set, we realized that we can actually do this very simple with a set of very simple logic operations, which means I pick up those two vectors, X1 and X0, we end them together and end also with a phenotype. And then if you apply pop count instruction, this is going actually to tell me how many patients have the disease in my data set for those two SNPs for that genotype combination. Of course, we will naturally repeat this for each guys in with a phenotype one. For phenotype zero, it is exactly the same computation that we do with tendon and pop count, just we have to do an invert our phenotype vector or complement it with not. So once we have our counts of how many guys with this genotype combination are having disease and not having a disease, we constructed their frequency table. But frequency table per se doesn't tell us anything. We need to evaluate it. So on top of this one, we have to apply an objective function. And in this study, we use Bayesian K2 score. Just imagine that there is a function that is going to squash all of those numbers into a single number. And then we are going to obtain a single number for all of those combinations and the minimum among all of them, we are going to use to say that probably this material presented in those SNPs have a really high probability that it actually contributes to this disease. So, okay, now when we are set up with this idea of what epistasis is disease and what, what we can do and what are our basic set of operations, we relied on Intel Advisor, and this is actually a special version of Intel Advisor that relies on that, that, that is enriched with logic operations. And we use cache very offline model to guide our optimizations. So basically, in this first step, we plotted our this basic implementation that we are going to call here to genotype plus phenotype version. And you see, you remember it was end and pop count and not operations. And then by plotting it in the roof line, what we can actually see by drawing this vertical line is that we are in mixed region, which is not easy to optimize, but we can see that it's kind of positioned more in the part that suggests memory boundness because it's L3 and then L2 until reaching the compute bound part. But then we decided not to follow roof line. So we decided to be smart. And then we thought, okay, one of the ways to implement, to, to actually improve my application is that to try to increase arithmetic intensity, which means Let's restructure my code in order to move my point more to the right. And if I more move more to the right, it means I will become more compute bound, has much better performance potentially. And in order to do that, what we realize is that, okay, phenotype vector we can actually kill and we can split our data set in two imaging matrices. One that is going to keep my controls, which means all the guys who don't have disease, and my case is all the guys who has the disease. And then we also realized that for any given patient, if it has a genotype combination, if it doesn't have genotype combination zero, and if he doesn't have genotype combination one, he must have a genotype combination two. So there is no reason to store it because all those genotypes two, we can infer from zeros and ones. So we remove this third green vector, as you can see, it does not exist here. So it will mean that I will reduce my data transfers by one third plus the fact that I'm going to remove my phenotype vector, which is quite a good thing. I will spend less time on transferring the data. And what it actually results is by removing phenotype, I lost one more end here and probably some knots. But OK, we added here a little bit north in order to reconstruct our second genotype from the first two. 
And then we thought by being smart, we'll get really cool results. But what we actually saw is that by being smart, we moved to the right, what we expected, but we actually got performance decrease. So we reduced our performance but 1.2 times. And that was unexpected for us. And then we start analyzing. And what we actually realized is that by removing all those data transfers, we were good because we decreased our bytes transferred by 6.2 times. But we also decreased all of operations that we are doing by 4.3 times, which is not a good thing. So when we mix those two, we improved our arithmetic intensity by 1.4 times, move to the right, good. And potentially we, are, we have a good algorithm because it's more to the right. But decreasing the ALU operations was really bad, right? Because in that case, it means that the speed up that you get, the reduction in time, it has to be sufficient enough in order to compensate the loss of ALU operations here. So just think about your performance here is IPC. And it does not have to necessarily relate to your speed up since we restructure the algorithm. So those two points, in fact, you can even look to them as two different algorithms. So yeah, by being smart, we got speed up of oh, about two times, but this speed up is not enough to compensate for the, for the decrease in the other operations that we have, hence we have a performance drop. But since we thought, okay, this algorithm is potentially good, then we decided to actually follow a cache of error offline model uh, guidelines in order to further improve the performance. So now our point here is very close to the DRAM line, so which strongly suggests memory boundness. And then the first of the things that everybody would probably try is to increase our utilization of the caches. And one of the typical strategies, and this is the one that we actually did, is to do some cache styling or cache blocking for uh, this uh, algorithm. Once we did it, what we can see is that our arithmetic didn't, uh, intensity didn't significantly change. But what actually did is that now we improved our performance and we got a speed up of around 2.5 times. So it worked. And then we start analyzing more what we can do here. So when we look to this point, now we are very close to our compute roof, which might suggest that maybe we can try to vectorize it and squeeze even more performance out of this code. By vectorizing, we got 3.5 times of the improvement over the first version that we have and more than three times speed up. Uh, the problem that we have here is actually in the architecture because this architecture that we tested uh, actually supports only scalar pop counts. We expect significantly better results in the, the next generation of Intel processors such as Ice Lake X because that those guys actually support uh, AVX 512 pop counts. So, okay, once we achieved what we could achieve in a single core, naturally we wanted to run it, to, to actually split it and then do multi-core version of our code. And what you can actually see is that we got around 20 times speed up on a six core machine of Intel and uh, around 19 times or 18.6 times in terms of the performance improved. So, Cache of error offline model worked, but we also didn't stop there. So our recent research is also exploiting the possibilities of a heterogeneous computing in uh, CPU and GPU uh, Intel platforms. So for which one uh, we recently published a paper on um, exploiting collaborative computing between CPU and iGPU, for which naturally we got really good performance by using both of them and speed it up significantly for K equal two, which means pairwise interaction, but also for uh, the higher order epistasis, which is three-way interaction. And those guys have many, many, many more combinations to do. And what we also evaluated here is also power and energy efficiency. And uh, what is maybe not surprising, but it was really nice to see is that by relying only mostly on the iGPU execution and Gen 9 5 architecture, uh, we could achieve uh, best power and energy efficiency. So just to conclude this talk, so in this talk, we talk about the cache of our offline model. We cover the basics or fundamentals behind the performance cache of our offline model, also its extensions for power and energy efficiency. And we show several case studies, one of them uh, on uh, bioinformatics in detecting the epistasis detection. So all the other information is actually 
in our scientific papers, but I try to simplify this presentation in order to make it more human tractable. So thank you very much. I think this concludes this presentation. I'm happy to receive questions.